Wow. Is it any wonder that Jesus said we need to become like little children? Because they know how to enter into the presence of God through praise and worship. And they brought us with them into that presence of God. Let's pray together as we get ready to open God's Word. The Heavenly Father, it is so good to be in this place today. It's good to be here today because we know that where two or three are gathered, there Jesus is gathered with them. And so we thank you, Father, not, not for the metaphorical, but we thank you for the reality that Jesus is here in our midst. And Father, as we prepare ourselves to spend a few moments in time in your word, Father, I pray that you'll remove all distractions. May we not be distracted by the things of the people around us. May we not be distracted by many of the things that we brought in here, the stresses and pressures of this past week. Remove all of those distractions in this moment because there is a word you want to whisper into our hearts. Father, we await that word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As darkness settled over the city, one person after the other began to approach the home that was located on the eastern side of the city. And each person approached individually, precisely timed out that each new person would arrive at the door of that house five minutes after the previous. And as they approached that door, they would knock three times on the door, wait for a few seconds, and then one more knock, and that door would slowly crack open, just enough for them to slip through the shadows and inside the house. For over an hour, this went on as one person after the other made their way to the home, gave the secret knock, and was invited in. And finally, when everyone was there, They gathered in one of the back rooms of the house, too afraid for much light. They all gathered around the dim glow of a single candle, and there they began to pray. No one was aware as they began to pray, nor had they been aware as they had slipped up towards the house that a large group of soldiers were hiding in the shadows. And now that everyone was inside that house, Again, they were unaware that even as they prayed, soldiers were beginning to make their way up towards the house in silence until they had surrounded the house, cutting out all means of escape. Then once all means of escape had been taken care of, a group of those soldiers burst through the front door, those in the back room in deep prayer, suddenly are aroused in a panic to the sound that someone has just broken in through the front door. But there's no time to react. There's there's no time to do anything. And before they know it, a group of soldiers, their swords drawn, burst into the very room where they're praying, followed close on their heels by a man that everyone knows. He is the most feared man in the city of Jerusalem. You can almost see the blood of Christians still dripping from his hands as he enters into the room. And his voice is angry and mean as he cries out at those gathered in prayer, Blasphemers! How dare you worship a man who's dead and gone, dead and buried? And one older man at the back of the room, not filled with fear at this man's words, said, Sir, we don't worship a man who's dead and gone. But we worship a living, breathing, resurrected Savior. We worship the Messiah. Saul immediately charged at the man and with one backhand sent him flying into the wall. Then he ordered the soldiers there to chain and to lead every man, woman, and child in that room to awaiting carts. Early. Early the next morning, Saul, back from yet another successful raid against the Christians, stands in the presence of the high priest, who gives all kinds of praise and honor to this man, a man who has made sure that everyone he secured in that home that night have either been tortured and imprisoned or already executed. As the high priest praises him, 
for his good work. Saul thanks him for the praise and, and then asks that the high priest give him a letter, a letter authorizing him to travel out of the city of Jerusalem to go to all of the cities of the nearby regions and hunt down all of those who claim the name of Jesus Christ. Happily, the high priest writes out the warrant and hands it to Paul. The next day, that warrant tucked inside the pocket of his cloak. He mounts a horse with a small group of soldiers and he begins traveling down the road to the city of Damascus. And after a hard week of traveling, they finally see the object of their journey. They see right ahead of them the city of Damascus. But it is at that moment that suddenly a blinding light bursts through the sky. And Saul sitting there on his horse, as he tries to shield his eyes from the burning light, he can see that someone or something is appearing in that light. And as the figure in that bright light becomes more clear and more clear, Suddenly, Saul sees something that causes his mouth to drop wide open, something that sends a chill up his spine, something that causes him to literally topple from his horse because as that figure nears and holds out his hands, he sees the nail prints in the hands of the one he now recognizes to be the living, breathing Jesus Christ. The soldiers who were following him, uh, they've seen the light, but they can't see the one who is the light and is walking in the light. They hear the sound of what sounds to be like thunder, but they cannot hear the words that Jesus is now speaking to Saul as he lays there on his face. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Jesus says. And then Jesus tells Saul that he has shown up in this moment because he has a special mission for Saul. And he tells Saul, I want you to go into the city of Damascus and there I will tell you what to do. As the light fades away, the soldiers approach their fallen comrade, still unaware of what's happened, but now Saul has become very aware of what's happened to him in this brightness. He has now gone blind in the lights. And so his soldiers supporting him on either side walk him into the city of Damascus. And there for the next three days, he will sit in total darkness in a rented home until God appears to one of his servants, until God appears to Ananias, one of God's disciples there in the city of Damascus, and sends him on a mission to the last person he ever wanted to see or speak to in his life. God, you can't be serious. You don't want me to go see him, do you? I, I, I know, God, that your mercy is, is incredible. I know that your grace is big. But, God, there is a limit, right, to your mercy and to your grace. It saved a sinner such as I. But, Lord, we're not talking about a sinner such as I. Lord, we're talking about the sinner of all sinners. We're talking about Saul. By the way, just in case you've forgotten, God, this is the man who persecutes, who imprisons, and who murders Christians. You sure you got the message right, God? I've got the message right. I want you to go to this home on the city, on the road called Straight. And I have a message that you're to take to Saul. And so reluctantly, he enters into the home where Saul still sits in blindness. But there's now no hesitation he immediately walks up towards Saul, places his hands on Saul's eyes, and in that moment, Paul sees the light. Not only the light because his physical blindness is gone, but in that moment, Paul truly sees the light because now his spiritual blindness is gone. That is the amazing grace of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
grace so amazing that it can save even someone like Saul who would become Paul. In fact, it's, a, it's grace so amazing, it's almost impossible to believe it could be true. In fact, there were those who wondered if it really could be true, if you have your Bibles with you. Turn with me to the book of Acts, the book of Acts. The book of Acts, the ninth chapter. The book of Acts, the ninth chapter, and beginning in verse number 21. Notice the reaction to this astounding grace of God. Acts, the ninth chapter, verse 21, says this about the reaction of those in Damascus to God's grace intersecting into the life of this murderer named Saul. Verse 21, and all those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priest? All were amazed in Damascus at the extent of God's grace, the depth of of God's mercy, the willingness of God to forgive. But not all were convinced that God's grace was so amazing that it could save even a wretch like Paul. And so when he travels to the city of Jerusalem, hoping to meet the disciples, the original 11 disciples of Jesus face to face, notice their cold reaction to Paul's appearance. In verse number 26, and when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. Today, I want to talk to you about the incredible, amazing grace of Jesus Christ. Today, I want to talk to you about God's mercy that knows no end. Today, I want to talk to you about God's forgiveness that's opened and ready to receive anyone. And Paul would never forget that amazing grace that Jesus offered him here in Acts, the ninth chapter, because Paul would go on later to describe how God's grace was so amazing that even a self-described individual as he was, he would self-describe himself as the chief of all sinners, God's grace, his mercy, and his forgiveness are big enough and large enough to extend to even the chief of all sinners. And if God's mercy and grace and forgiveness is big enough and broad enough and deep enough and wide enough to extend to even the worst of all sinners, then maybe today... God's grace, God's forgiveness, God's mercy is deep enough and wide enough even for a sinner like me, even for a sinner like you. But you see, there is, I recognize, when we talk about the amazing grace and mercy and forgiveness that God has, enough mercy and grace to forgive every sin that has ever been committed and still have grace and mercy left over. I know that I'm talking today about a double-edged sword because on the one side, praise the Lord, there's grace for you, there's grace for me. But on the other edge of that sword, sometimes we get uncomfortable talking about the amazing, incredible grace of God because we say, well, wait a minute, if we, if we talk in too stark terms about how amazing and broad Christ's grace is, aren't we leaving then a loophole for sin? In his book, Philip Yancey in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, tells the story of a friend of his who invited him to go out to dinner because there was something he wanted to talk to Philip about. And as Philip and Dennis sat there in the restaurant eating dinner together, Dennis began to open up to him that he had fallen in love with someone other than his wife. 
He described to Philip how he had met this younger, prettier woman. And though he could not pretend that there were actually even problems in his relationship with his wife, he just wanted a change because she just made him feel younger, more handsome. But it was over dessert when he got to his fullest question. And finally, he put this on the line as they sat eating their apple crisp. He said, Philip, this is what I really want to know. If, if I do this, if, if I turn my back on my wife, if I turn my back on the three kids that she and I share, Philip, I want you to tell me, will God forgive me? And Philip said it, the question sat there for a while, just like a coiled snake on the table. And finally, after moments of reflection and prayer, Philip said to his friend Dennis, he said, Dennis, the question is not, can God forgive you? God, God can forgive us. God can forgive us for anything. I mean, the Bible is full of stories of adulterers and murderers like King David, who God forgave. It, the New Testament was founded, or the New Testament church, I should say, was founded by scoundrels like Peter, who denied Jesus, and Paul, who was a persecutor of those who loved Jesus. No, no, the question is not, Philip said to Dennis, can God forgive you? Because you see, forgiveness is our problem, not God's. And the question is not, can God forgive you? But the problem is that sin, in the moment we enter into that rebellious act of sin, sin puts distance between us and God. And the question is not, will God forgive you? He can. But the question you need to ask yourself, Dennis, is will you ever want God to forgive you? Two months later, he heard the news that Dennis had left his wife, he had left his three kids, he had now moved in with this younger and, and prettier woman. But in so doing, he had cut off all of his relationship with his previous friends because he now considered them to be too stuffy to hang out with. He had surrounded himself by a new enlightened group of friends who took no issue with what he had done. Now he tended to justify himself by talking about all the problems that he had had in his marriage. And God? Who needs God when you've got a pretty young woman that floats your boat? See, Paul, Paul who understands probably more than any of us in this room the amazing, incredible grace, mercy, and forgiveness of Jesus Christ, understood also the dangers of human beings seeking to use God's grace as a loophole so I can do whatever I want and get forgiveness later. So turn with me to Paul's most in-depth discussion about the amazing grace in the book of Romans the fifth chapter to Paul's most poignant sermon on the incredible grace of God that we silly, sinful humans that oftentimes look to exploit God's very grace. In Romans, the fifth chapter, in verse number 20, Paul again makes sure that we're clear that there are no limits to God's grace. He says this, Romans 5, verse 20, The law was added so that trespass might increase, but where sin increased, what increased all the more? Grace increased. So make no bones about it, said Paul. I'm not going to dumb down, shrink the grace, the mercy, the forgiveness. It is unending that Jesus has. And let us never preach limited grace. Let us never preach limited forgiveness. Let us never preach limited mercy. Because that's not the grace 
in the mercy and the forgiveness that we find in Jesus Christ. But at the same time, Paul understands the loopholes to grace exploitation that he's just opened. And so he addresses head on in the chapters that follow, in Romans the sixth chapter, and Ro- the first part of Romans the seventh chapter. Paul engages head on with the reality of the danger of settling for loopholes of God's grace. Chapter six, verse one says this What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means says Paul. And then let your eyes fall down to verse number 15. What then shall we sin? Because we are not under law, but under grace, to which again Paul emphatically says, no, by no means. Paul understands that in the broad claims that he's making of the never-ending grace of Jesus Christ, there will be those who will exploit that grace to their own ends. And so Paul is now responding to those who would do it. And before we can fully analyze Paul's response to those who look for loopholes in God's grace, we need to first understand what sin is for Paul. And he lays it out here very clearly in some of the verses here in Romans, the sixth chapter. Verse number two, listen to this. By no means we died to sin. How can we then do what? What? How can we live in it any longer if we've died to it? Verse number 12. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. And then look down to verse 16. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to the obedience, which leads to righteousness. You understand what Paul's saying here about sin? Because you cannot analyze Paul's arguments to close these loopholes that we seem to find as sinful human beings with God's amazing grace until you understand with Paul what sin really is. For Paul, sin is not an occasional act of wrongdoing. Sin at its heart is not those moments in time where I do something against the law of God. That's not the real root of sin for Paul. It's not occasional acts But for Paul, the real definition of sin is this. Sin is a way of life. It is a life orientation. And Paul is making the argument here in Romans, the sixth chapter, that there are only two orientations that our life can have. Either we have a sin orientation or we have a Jesus orientation. We either have a death orientation or we have an orientation to life. So Paul says sin is not merely the small acts here and there, but sin is the overall way in which our life is oriented. Are we oriented to sin? Are we oriented to Jesus? Are we oriented to death? Are we oriented to life? Now, says Paul, once you begin to understand that sin is not individual acts, but it is a life orientation, now you can understand why when you have been engraced, when you have been embraced by the incredible grace, mercy, and forgiveness of Jesus Christ, you don't go looking for loopholes in that grace. And he will make three arguments, three arguments for why we do not go looking for loopholes to God's grace when we've truly experienced that in our lives. And the first one he he lays out here very clearly, chapter 6 again, verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? So Paul says, sin has this stench of death about it. And when your nostrils have been woken up through the grace and mercy and forgiveness of Jesus Christ to this death stench 
that sin is. Once you've smelled the death stench, how can you ever embrace it again? Now, my wife hates when I tell this story, so sorry, honey. It's just a good example, all right? I don't know how many of you have cats in your home. Anybody have indoor cats? Well, you, you'll still relate to this anyway. We, we have a literal farm at home, and I mean that very literally. You wouldn't believe how many animals we have outside in our barn and how many animals we have inside our house. But some of those which we have inside our house are cats that live inside the house. And if you have a house-only cats, then you've got to have a litter box, right, for them to go and, and do their thing, all right? Now, if you've lived with cats long enough, even if you are faithful in scooping out their litter boxes on a daily basis, right? There's still a stench of ammonia. I'm being kind of kind in how I say that. There, there, there's still a little bit of a stench of ammonia that goes with that. No matter how faithful you are in clearing, cleaning litter boxes out, there's still that there. But you, when you've lived with cats for long enough, you don't even notice that stench anymore. People walk into your house and they go, what's that? And you go, oh, the litter box. Not my wife's fault, my fault. Let's make that clear. Because I want to have a happy Sabbath at home today. <laughs> but you get the point, right? When you've been surrounded by the stench enough, even the stench of death no longer fills your nostrils. But once you have been exposed to the fragrant perfume of grace, as you breathe deeply in of the scent of God's amazing grace, His unending mercy and His incredible forgiveness, suddenly your nostrils open up and suddenly you recognize that where you have been living most of your life, wow, how did I never see this before? It smells like death here. And so says Paul, once Jesus has opened up your nostrils to the stench of death, could you ever really go back to death again? Oh, Jesus, this is beautiful. Love the smell of your grace and perfume, but I think I'm going to go over here and smell the dead. Paul says, there's no way you can do that. Once you've chosen to have your life oriented to Jesus and not oriented to sin, you begin to smell the stench of sin against the perfume of Jesus, and there's no going back. No going back. But Paul continues. He, he doesn't leave it there. He continues on in verse number 3. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Jesus were baptized unto his death. You talked about baptism last night. My good friend and colleague, I know she tore up the place. I just know, Dr. Hyvin, I know she tore up the place last night talking to you about baptism. And Paul here uses the metaphor of baptism to say that when we choose to leave behind the sin orientation and enter into a Jesus orientation, that we literally enter into death in baptism with Jesus. And when we go under that water, our old sin-oriented life is symbolically being taken away underneath those waters. In fact, I, we have a good friend, a good friend of our, our family, who I had the privilege years ago of baptizing her. I've since had the privilege of baptizing her daughter, um, her daughter and her son. She's a single mom, they are our godchildren. We've been the spiritual parents of her and, and her children. I'll never forget, though, the day that I was going to baptize her, because just right as we got into the tank, or just before we got into the tank, she said to me, she said, Kenley, she said, I, I've been so caught up in this death stench. My life has been so oriented in, in this direction. I want to make sure that all of that is dead and gone and buried. So she said, I can hold my breath for a while, Pastor. And she said, so when you lay me under the water, she said, don't just lay me under and yank me up. That's no death. 
He says, I want to feel like I've died under the water. He says, I'm going to hold my breath, and when I'm ready, I'll squeeze your arm and you pull me up. Now, I'm not stupid, so I did announce to the congregation, I said, now, I don't want anyone to think that when Pastor Hall baptizes you, he tries to drown you. So this is what she's asked for. So this is not me, this is what she's asked for. But neither myself nor the audience real could, could even fathom how long that woman could hold her breath. I mean, she's down there and she's down there and she's down there and I'm thinking, do I still see bubbles? By now, the whole congregation is beginning to gasp. And finally, I feel that squeeze on my arm and I pull her back up with a smile from face to face because she says, I've left the stench and I've resurrected to new life in Jesus because in Jesus, all things are passed away. All things become new. So says Paul. How could we ever go back to that stench when we've left that stench behind in baptism and we become a new person, a Jesus-oriented person through our baptism with Jesus? Paul then goes to his second argument about how the loopholes to God's grace become closed when we truly experience God's grace. Verse number 15. What then shall we sin? Because we are not under law, but under grace. By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. So says Paul. Number one, you don't look for loopholes of grace, because once you've experienced grace, you know the stench of sin. But secondly, says Paul, you recognize that life is under the control. Your life is under the control of either the devil or Jesus. And you are slaves whether you realize it or not. There is no such thing as neutrality. There is no fifth post to sit on in life. You will either fully on Satan's side, or you're fully on Jesus' side, no straddling the fence. You're either cold or you're hot. There's no in-betweens. And so says Paul, you make the choice. Will you be a slave to sin, or will you be a slave to righteousness, a slave to Jesus Christ? And here's the irony of it all. <laughs> Here, here's the irony. Some of us want so much to be free, free of Jesus, free of all those rules that we find in, in the, the Old Testament, the New Testament. We so desperately long to be free that we enslave ourselves deeper than we ever intended. And so, in our desire to be free, we say, you know, I'm just going to let loose my temper you know, when, when, when I'm angry, there's no reason to hold on to it. Just going to let it go. And suddenly we find ourselves becoming slaves to anger. When I'm on my computer and I'm clicking a few things, you know, I'm just on here to look at CNN. And when that thing on the side pops up that says, hot Russian babes, click the button. I, I, I'm, I'm just going to take a peek, I'm just going to take a look, and suddenly we find ourselves slaves to pornography. It's really striking to me, and Philip Yancey points this out in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, that the very things that oftentimes teens do to assert their freedom are drugs, alcohol, pornography, smoking, and suddenly they find that those very things that they thought would declare their freedom becomes the very things that enslave them. Paul says, we don't go looking for loopholes of God's grace when we've experienced it because we want to be free in Jesus, not slaves anymore to sin. And we understand that's what sin is. It's not a mere act, but sin is that which pulls us in, which sucks us in, which binds us in. But still not sure that he has made his best 
and most convincing argument. Paul in Romans, the seventh chapter, lays down one more analogy. That not only do we close the loopholes because sin is stench, not only do we close the loopholes because we choose not to be bound slaves of sin, but servants of Jesus Christ. But he says, here's one more reason that we close the loopholes to sin. Do you not know, brothers, for I, I'm speaking to men who know the law, that the law has authority over a man only as long as he lives. For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. So then, if she marries another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law, and it is not an adulteress even though she marries another man. So, my brothers, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you may belong to another, to him who's raised you from the dead in order that we might bear fruit to God. Here Paul goes to his last, final, and most convincing argument of why when we experience the fullness of God's grace, we don't go looking for loopholes to exploit. And he puts it in the context of marriage. Can you imagine, for just a moment, in the context of marriage, when Rochelle and I were married on June the 16th, 1990, can you imagine as if we were, as we were exchanging vows, I said, time out for just a moment. I know I'm committing myself to you for a lifetime. I, I know that I'm saying through sickness and health and all of that. But time out, let's talk about the loopholes. Where, where can I play on the fringes? of my commitment with you. Is it okay if I just uh, uh, date other women, uh, you know, once in a while? Is that a good loophole? Well, you know what the case is going to be. I hope that if I'd ever said something like that, the response of my wife, and I'd give her every right to do this, would be to slap me upside the face. Not promoting violence here. But I would understand it. I mean, what kind of person that's deeply in love with someone else says, I'm deeply in love with you, I'm fully committed to you, but how much will you allow me to play around over here while I'm still committed to you? And see, for Paul, this is the kicker. Love is the one thing that closes all of the loopholes of exploitation when it comes to God's grace. Augustine, the church father, had it right when he said, if we truly love God, we can do anything we want. If we truly love God, we can do anything we want, because that which we want when we truly love God will be that which brings honor and glory to God. It will be that that does not put Jesus back on the cross again. But it will be that that puts a smile on the face of the one that we love. So says Paul. Never, never pull down. Ne never try to shrink God's grace, God's forgiveness, God's mercy. Church, never try to shrink it down. It is much bigger than even any of us in this room fully fathom or realize. Because at the end of the day, there really are no loopholes to God's amazing grace. Because when we've left the stench, and we know the stench. When we've left the slavery of, and we know the slavery of sin, when we've experienced the love of God, we would no longer ask ourselves anymore, what can I get away with while still experiencing God's grace? But instead of looking for loopholes, we would spend the rest of our lives trying just to fathom the depths of God's love the depths of God's grace, the depths of God's mercy, the depths of God's forgiveness. I want to do something that's a little bit off script here today because I know as we've gone through this hope revived that after the speaker has spoke, then we open up the floor for, for questions. And I'll be happy to dialogue with you later. I, 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 I feel the need to open up the floor not for your questions, but a question that God wants to hold out to you.
And the question that God wants to hold out to you is simply this. As you see God's grace, as you see God's mercy, as you sense God's forgiveness, what do you want to do with that today? Do you want to stay in a life of orientation to sin when there's a much better life in an orientation to Jesus? Do you want to stay chained and bound by whatever it is in your life that chains and binds you? Because ultimately that is all that sin does. It chains and it binds us. Or do you want to be set free in Jesus Christ? Today, Jesus' question to you is, which life do you choose? Which orientation do you choose? And Jesus' plea is simply this. Choose me. Choose life. Choose Jesus. So we sing our song of closing today that's there listed in the bulletin. And again, my apologies to the pastor for changing up here. But sometimes the Spirit says something different. And so while we sing that chorus, faith is the victory, uh, I just want to hold out the invitation to you. If there's someone here today, as we sing that song, that you're saying, you know, I've, I've recognized that, that I've been trying to exploit the loopholes of grace, but I don't want to do that any longer. I, I, I don't want to live a life that goes back to that stench. I want to live a life in the perfumed air of Jesus Christ. There's someone here today that is saying, I'm tired of being enslaved. There is some area that I realize I am enslaved in today. I want to be set free in Jesus. As we sing together, I'll just invite you to come and then I'll pray for you as we end.